This group chat was inspired by real life events. <laughs> you gotta love a group chat. Everybody's a part of at least one. These group dynamics are like a microcosm of life. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, would you speak to us through your word now? This is our worship in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, um, the newlywed season is particular in my mind for a number of reasons, none more so than how insufferable I probably was as a, as a recently unsingle young man who came from a, a, a sense of right that was overdeveloped. So in the newlywed years, did you go through this? Any of you who are married, any of you who are not married uh, or engaged, this may be coming for you. This sense of sort of perpetual surprise and indignance at, at how wrongly things can be done. You know, uh, I came into marriage, I realized, with a, a laundry list of unarticulated and probably unrealized expectations. Like, for example... In, it seems good to me and the Holy Spirit that you should not only wash in the sink, but that you should wash out the sink, right? You should wash the food and detritus out of the dishes in the sink, but then afterward, you should scrub the inside of the sink so that food and detritus doesn't sit there and bacteria build up and gross things that we all know about. Like we live in the 21st century. Germs happen. These are, this isn't new. So that seems to be clearly and the right way. Uh, and so I came into marriage with this, with this unreasonable, unspoken expectation that it be done right, right? I mean, there's two kinds of people in the world. There are, I, I quickly learned, there are those that wash out the sink afterward and those that, having washed in the sink, leave the sink itself dirty. Inexplicable to me. Um, but I, I, I think I was a, kind of a jerk about that. Because I had this expectation that my wife would be able to read my mind and know what right looked like to me, what I saw lived out in front of me, and, and what was decent and normal. And so that plays out in a thousand mundane things, and Jesus files down our rough edges through the sacred institution of marriage. Really what it was, what it was, was just all, all that to say it was just dressed up and prettily packaged judgment. That's all it was. Matthew chapter 7, famous words, Jesus said, judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is this log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. It seems like what Jesus is essentially saying is, stay in your lane, bro. And that's our title for this morning. Jack Johnson, that smooth singing, surfing prophet, said, everybody thinks that everybody knows about everybody else. Nobody knows anything about themselves. Few of us, rather, than, no, no one knows anything about themselves. Oh, there's one more line. Because they're all worried about everybody else. How true that is. Jack Johnson's essentially taking Jesus' most famous sermon in the world and putting it to catchy music that somehow sounds like every song on every other Jack Johnson album, but we like them. That was judgment. I just did it. I just judged. I just made my own point. Dang it. Forgive me, Lord. 
Jesus said, how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there's this log, this log in your own eye, you hypocrite. And Jesus gets to the heart of it. Hypocrisy is what's at stake here, right? It's insufferable. It's galling when somebody is saying, hey, do it right and clean the sink out while doing 50 things wrong himself. None of us can suffer a hypocrite. If there's any like last common American virtue standing, it might be anti-hypocrisy. We can all beat us up a hypocrite, right? So what does this do to our relationships? Well, it strains them, of course. And so what we end up doing is we keep our distance. Nothing kills community like judgment. Have you noticed? Nothing kills community like judgment. It's like pouring salt on your grass. Romans chapter 14, the apostle Paul writes you then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Why do you treat them with contempt? It's what really judgment is, isn't it? We will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will acknowledge God. I got the judgment. I got this. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Paul writes this in the closing remarks of his seminal letter to the Roman church, talking about theology, yes, in the first three quarters of it, and then about the practicals of putting it into action, living out this theology in the context of community and growing that way. And he says, chief among the important requirements for that to work, stop passing judgment on one another. Stop passing judgment on one another. This is one of those things that, it's sort of a tricky sermon to preach because as a teacher, you like to turn the light bulb on, right? It's part of the, it's part of the joy, illuminating. You like the moment where there's an aha experience. And this passage doesn't lend itself to any aha experience. It's sort of like you read the three or four verses from Matthew 7. Maybe you play the little clip of the funny AT&T commercial tattoo dude and you're like, all right, Let's do it. And that's pretty much it. Don't, I mean, some, some points need elucidating. Nobody judges for lack of knowing what judgment is. It's really that we don't see it in ourselves. Boy, do we see it in others. And that's the hypo- hypocrisy Jesus is pointing out. And so there is the face value over judgments. You know, you're dumb. That's wrong. You shouldn't do this. And, and those we, we do sometimes, we don't need to have as much pointed out what that looks like. But man, there are so many subtle ways we judge. Like mind reading. Assuming that you know what someone else is thinking or feeling. Mind reading says this. This is its, this is its giveaway phrase. I can tell. Can you now? Can you tell what he's thinking, what she's feeling? Boy, you are pretty darn good, right? Mind reading is presuming to know what's happening inside of another person. Mind reading is negatively interpreting their behavior according to your predetermined script. Have you ever sent an email that you're particularly passionate about, a subject you're present to, and presume that everybody else is going to be equally passionate about that subject and equally present and available to respond as you were to write? And then a day passes, two days passes. On the third day, you haven't gotten a return email. You start judging, judge, judging why. Oh, they got offended. They're all into themselves. They don't care about this noble thing I'm doing. And then like on day four, you get a reply that's like, I'm so sorry. My father was in the hospital. Like, well, you could have taken time to email when you were in the waiting room, right? It's, we mind read when we presume to know what's going on in someone else's interior world and what's motivating them. In the, um, the book, The Emotionally Healthy Woman, it's one of the spinoffs from Emotionally Healthy Spirituality that Risa was mentioning. Peter and Jerry Schizero write, God is omniscient. 
He knows all things about all situations, and God alone knows what is going on in the minds of other people. Yet we routinely play God when we make assumptions about another person or interpret a certain behavior without verifying the facts. These assumptions, they unleash much needless pain and confusion, don't they? Let me share a phrase with you that can disarm this subtle way that we judge and get judged. When we find ourselves mind reading, before we say it, pause and check it. How do I know? Says who? Did this person share that this was the reason why, or am I assuming that? And then, instead of coming to the person with that foregone conclusion, what if we came to another person with this question? Hey, can I check an assumption? It's a kind phrase. Can I check an assumption? Like, I assume that you were late because you don't prioritize our friendship. Can I just check in with you about that? That's vulnerable. That's humble. That's the opposite of haughty and contemptuous. And it dignifies the other person to say, oh, no, I'm sorry. I actually um, just got overloaded at work and was running behind her. You know what? I just sometimes am not as strong with punctuality, but I'll really try to do that better. It creates a, a level relational playing field. Okay, subtle ways we judge. Number two, unsolicited opinions. The tell phrase for this one, you should. Do you know the person that is given to telling you periodically when, when you're, they, you share what's going on or something like that, and they're like, oh, you should, should I now? Any, any other input, any other uh, direction, any other broad advice from your high and lofty perch, your highness. You know, it immediately distances the relationship. When I come to you and say, you should, if we're in a relationship, as most of our relationships are, that doesn't involve authority. Now, if you're somebody's supervisor at work and they're not making the fries and the customers are waiting beyond the brand promise guarantee, you need to say, hey, you should get the fries done faster. But we're talking about lateral relationships. Man, It is said that advice that's not asked for is never received. Even if it's true, even if it's prudent. And I think that's wisdom. So a question we might ask ourselves before speaking our unsolicited opinion, is this input that I have a right to give? Was I asked for my opinion? Am I in a position of organizational or spiritual authority whereby it is natural or appropriate or somebody has submitted to my authority? Is this input that I have a right to give? Subtle ways we judge. Number three, you've already seen the example in real time. Pointed jokes. Oh, dang it. I, I am the like Jack Johnson joke critic. I hate it. I'm trying to, I'm asking the Holy Spirit to root that out of me. I like humor, but not as a way to, you know what we do? We use humor to launder our judgment, right? Just like mafia bosses use like um, pawn shops to launder their organized crime income. We use humor to launder our judgment. And by we, I mean me. Dang it, sorry. Straight up judgment It's kind of out of fashion right now, isn't it? So we we launder it through jokes. The question that is probably worth asking ourselves before we crack that joke, does this build up another? Now, I don't think Jack Johnson particularly cares what I think about his music, but in this case, I'm modeling, I'm permitting, I'm normalizing in relationship with people I love and who trust me using humor in a subtly pointed way. And I'm sorry for that. I was wrong. Last subtle way that we judge, at least that we're going to talk about this morning, unrealistic expectations. It's the sneakiest of judgments, right? It's, it's um, the expectation coming into marriage that you should clean out the sink after doing the dishes. 
because that's what I think is best. Unrealistic expectations are subtle judgment in two ways. They're subtle because they're unconscious often. They're unspoken almost always. And listen, they're unagreed on. I might have an expectation in my marriage, but if my wife and I haven't agreed on that expectation that this is what we're going to do together, I have no right to respond negatively to or enforce that expectation. It's judgment. If we have an expectation that I haven't even internalized or or recognized to myself, let alone vocalized, let alone had my wife sign on to and say, yeah, I agree to that. That's the way we're going to do it. Then my acting like that put off because that expectation went unmet, that's judgment. It's saying, I'm up here, you're down here, you did it wrong. Again, says who? I remember, I mean, there's loads of things that I think are clearly the right way. Like putting the toilet paper so it comes out over. Is there anyone else, group therapy moment, Is there anyone else who has, in a public restroom, attempted to jimmy the (laughs) toilet paper holder in order to flip it around? I want to know how many of us have done that. Okay, that's a shocking, that's a goodly number. That may be that this is just right. (laughs) No, but that's an unmet expectation, an unspoken, unagreed on expectation to ourselves, let alone to other people. Now, like the toothpaste thing is that, you know, although that one is more normalized because it actually prints it on the tube for best results. Squeeze tube from bottom and flatten as you go up. If it comes with directions, it's not subjective. I said this and my wife was like, I said this like six months ago as an illustration of what right looks like and how my wife more grabs the tube and squeezes from the middle and flattens like radially outward. I'm like, this is an inefficient use of the toothpaste. And she's like, says who? I'm like, the directions. It's not on the tube anymore. I'm like, if this isn't an instance of moral relativism. <laughs> first, Starbucks supports all these crazy causes. Now, Crest takes the directions off the toothpaste because they feel pressure from the, there's no right or wrong way to do the toothpaste, people. <sighs> Unrealistic expectations. It's judgment. And we all do it. So if judgment is so toxic, why do we do it? Isn't that really the question beneath this discussion? Why do we do it? Jesus said basically the very same question. Why do you see the speck in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that's in your own eye? Why? Perhaps Jesus' rhetorical question actually makes the point. We do it so we don't have to see ourselves. Judgment, I think, is almost always self-justification beneath the surface. Because judgment elevates us above others. Judgment says, you're really wrong, and so by comparison, I'm good. It's why in the Christian community over the last 30 years, we've gone to town on certain particular sinners right? I mean, we've hated, we've rejected, we've advocated for legislator to make sure that our country has no misgivings as to what we think about that sin. What about our sin? What about that lie we told or that judgment we passed, right? Judgment differentiates us from others, and it's really about self-justification. Jesus told a story in Luke chapter 18. It is haunting, It was a story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. He said, two men went to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not like other people. Cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I am certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of my income. The tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, Jesus said he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. Now, he said, I tell you, that sinner, not the Pharisee, 
returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. It's simple. It was self-justification. He judged that tax collector simply because he was there to be judged. It wasn't even about the tax collector. It was about himself. This person just served as a self-differentiating factor, a means of elevating himself and not having to focus on the log, as it were, in his own eye. And this guy, this self-justifier, he's everywhere. He lurks in all of us, and he is insufferable in a group. So he slowly drives people away. Remember um, in his book, Winning with People, years ago, John Maxwell observed this phenomenon. He called it the Bob Principle. He said, have you ever known Bob? Bob is the guy in a group that has a problem with everyone, can point out what's wrong with you, 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 and you. And Maxwell said, If Bob has a problem with everyone in the group, Bob is the problem. And there's a little Bob in all of us. Self-justification is, at the end of the day, self-denial. It's being false with ourselves. It's putting off Jesus. It's saying, I got this. And if we can't be real with ourselves... What hope do we have of being real with others in community? We pursue authentic community. That's one of our values here at Denver United. And in order to pursue authentic community, we have to be authentic with ourselves. Maybe Jesus' point here is simple. Maybe he's saying, be the other guy. The one who wasn't without sin himself, but who owned it. He, the tax collector, didn't even seem to notice the Pharisee was there because he was dealing with himself and his God. You hypocrite, Jesus said. First take the log out of your own eye and then then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Deal with the issues that you got going on. Because we've all got them. Jesus' idea is refocus that energy on our own growth. Refocus that energy that we so liberally apply on others in judging far and wide. Refocus that energy on our own growth. Growth. John Maxwell famously wrote, it's not them, it's you. Those are good words to remember. Romans chapter 12 Paul writes, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you'll learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you're better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves. Measuring yourselves, not by one another, not by someone that you can judge in order to elevate yourself by comparison, but measure yourselves by the faith that God's given each of us. He says two important things in this passage, and we'll wrap it up here. Don't think you're better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves. Dealing with judgment starts with judging ourselves. Scripture says it in the more traditional translations, with sober judgment. Dealing honestly with the way we view ourselves. We judge when we bring a double standard, right, to a relationship. Because if you ever notice this, we tend to judge ourselves by our best intentions while we judge others by their worst actions. We judge ourselves, if you got intentions here and actions there, by our very best intentions, we tend to judge others by their worst actions. And that double standard is going to lead to isolation and is going to kill 
community. The second thing this passage teaches that's so important is let God transform you. Reinvest that energy. Instead of looking at others, allow God, make room for God to transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Ah, see, that's where it gets tough, though. Oh, is that all I have to do? Why don't you just start with that? Just change the way I think. One, two, three, don't think of an elephant. So it's impossible just to change the way. If I could, I would, right? I lack the power to change the way I think. Many of us don't know we do it until we get older, until we get married or get into community, and others are like, bro, why are you always judging? What are you talking about? Well, when you do this and that, oh my gosh. I know it, I repent of it, but then I find myself doing it. I did it in a sermon on judgment. God help me. That, by the way, was not planned. So the, the, the question that this boils down to is, how? How do I change the way I think? Is that all? Can you just give me the two different thinking pills and call me in the morning? Ah. John chapter 16, Jesus says, I tell you the truth. It's better, it's to your advantage that I go away. Well, that's not going to change the way. If anything's going to at least be like training wheels for not thinking stupidly, it's going to be having Jesus with me, it would seem. But if I don't go away, the helper will not come to you. Who's the helper? Anyone know? The Holy Spirit. He said, if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit's not going to come. But if I go, I'll send him to you. And when he comes, listen, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. This does two things. One, it takes the burden off of me to have to be the world's moral policeman and convict everybody and and judge them because they're missing it. The Holy Spirit's got that covered. But two, and more immediately, the Holy Spirit is going to change the way I think. The power of positive thinking has some value, but it lacks the power to change the way I think. The Holy Spirit is going to change the way I think. Self-discipline is valuable and has some power, but it lacks the power at the end of the day holistically to change the way I think. The Holy Spirit is going to change the way I think. He is God. He's not some extra force. He's not some upgrade option if you grew up in the Pentecostal movement. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit live in perpetual communion, modeling that harmony for us. The Holy Spirit is God at work in us. The Holy Spirit is God in our hearts, bringing about God's transformation. So when Scripture says, be transformed by changing the way you think, that isn't by reading a self-help book. That is by yielding to God in me and allowing the Holy Spirit to remake me from the inside out. The scripture says in Romans 8, the mind governed by the sinful nature leads to death. But the mind governed by the Holy Spirit leads to life and peace. Who's governing your mind? It's either our sinful nature or we've outsourced it to someone else in the world, or it's the Spirit of God within us. And so we're going to simply pray and invite the Holy Spirit as a practice, as a moment in faith, but also as a role modeling for ourselves, for a daily practice. Holy Spirit, would you fill me anew and afresh? Would you change the way I think? Would you give me, as scripture teaches, would you give me the mind of Christ that I would take the log out of my own eye by your power and then worry about everyone else later, that I would not judge lest I be judged. Would you work this in me? Would you stand there with me? We're going to pray and then just respond in a time of invitation and surrender to the Holy Spirit. Can I lead you in prayer? Is that all right if we pray a little bit in church? 
our hands open to heaven is a demonstration of an inward willingness, an openness. It's not a demonstration of affiliation with any church tradition or denomination or movement. It's a demonstration of willingness. Would you pray this with me? Use your words or just pray my words. It's not your words, it's your faith. Holy Spirit, I invite you. Would you invite him now? Come and fill me anew and afresh today. Oh God, in me, how I need you. Ask him now. He says, you parents know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Holy Spirit, would you work in me anew? Would you fill me up again? Because God knows I leak. And this world's taken it out of me. I've made a mess of it. Now would you work in me, transforming me by renewing my mind, by changing the way I think. Would you reorder my thought patterns so that they don't bypass the log in my eye and go to the speck in my brother's? so that I don't perseverate on judging others in order to justify myself. Change that thought pattern so that I look at me, not with condemnation or judgment. There is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, but that I look at me with the compassion with which you look at me and with the willingness with which you bring to change me. You said, Jesus, you're making all things new. Would you make my mind new? Now I'll pray this. This is a prayer. That was a prayer of invitation. I invite you. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. This is a prayer of illumination. Holy Spirit, would you, working powerfully in me, would you illuminate judgment in me? Would you pray that? Would you show me subtle ways, maybe unsubtle ways, that I judge? That I am being inauthentic with myself and my community and killing group life around me. Ways I don't even see. Ways I haven't even felt bad about, like pointed jokes. Would you illuminate judgment in me, Holy Spirit? You said, Jesus, that the Holy Spirit would convict the world of sin. Would you convict me? Do you have one? We don't have to do it all today. We're just practicing. This is, I'm just modeling for you an inner life that I think Jesus wishes to be our daily experience with him. So we prayed for invitation for the Holy Spirit, illumination. Do you have one? Maybe one area like for me, the pointed joke thing. Do you have one? Now this, the next prayer is a prayer of repentance. Your kindness, Father, leads us to repentance. Thank you that you don't lead us to repentance at the point of a spear or the crack of a whip, but rather with kindness. Thank you, Jesus, that you willingly went to the cross, that you died so that I could be forgiven and that I could be set free, so that I could be washed clean of that judgment and that it would no longer grip me. So, Father, in Jesus' name, that means by, because of Jesus, through Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross. I repent of judgment. Would you take a minute and just repent? Repentance involves confession. It's getting real. I confess it. I don't hide my sin before you. And then it involves turning. I choose a new way. I choose the transformation, the healing of my heart that you offer. I choose your restoration work in me. Now, Spirit of God, would you grow me? Would you grow new fruit in place of what you're a pruning? in place of that judgment, would you grow encouragement, affirmation? The Word of God says whatever is true, 
noble, just, pure, excellent, admirable, uplifting, praiseworthy. Think about these things. Spirit of God, you who grow fruit, would you grow this fruit in my heart instead? That where I would have brought judgment, I would instead bring encouragement.